Hey, it's Mike here, and today, another absurdly common female reproductive disease, PCOS, or polycystic ovarian syndrome. We're gonna make it less confusing and look at a bunch of research on how diet can affect it. And this disease is super important, and everyone should know about it, including dudes like me, and that's because it is the number one cause of infertility. So, as a human, you should probably learn about it I'm glad I did. There's gonna be a ton of research and information in this video, so prepare yourself. You just gotta be a mental sponge. Just be a sponge. And when we're done with the research, we're gonna cautiously look at a few cases of PCOS reversal, which is super interesting and inspiring. All right, let's get going. First, let's start with some background on the disease because not that many people know very much about it. Depending on the severity, symptoms include hirsutism, which is excess body or facial hair, and that's 70% of women with PCOS. And interestingly, many of the bearded women throughout history probably had PCOS. There's also male pattern baldness, but really often manifests as just hair thinning for women. Unlike in the case with male hair loss, thankfully in many cases hair can regrow here. Next we have a loss of period, which is again why it's the number one cause of infertility. Next there's acne, usually on the jawline, and this is 10 to 34% of women with PCOS, which is much higher than the regular population. Next there's you know mood swings and depression and your standard low energy, which seems to be every disease. Next there's weight gain, which is a little nuanced because weight gain and PCOS work off each other, and about 50% of women with PCOS are obese. And in terms of the amount of women who have PCOS in general, we're looking at five to 10% by most measurements, but using certain criteria, it can be as high as 15 to 20%, which is ridiculously huge. Now the name PCOS itself is a bit limiting and confusing, and with a simpler name, more people would probably know about it. And it gets even more confusing because you don't even have to have verified cysts on your ovaries to be diagnosed with PCOS. Looking to the Rotterdam criteria, you need need two out of three of these. One is clinical and or biochemical hyperandrogenism or excess testosterone, ovulation issues, and then number three is the actual cysts on your ovary. Yeah, it's confusing. I mean, from a logical naming perspective, imagine going to the doctor and they're like, uh, yup, it appears that you have polycancer. I have cancer? No, 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 it doesn't actually guarantee that you have cancer per se. What? What kind of doctor are you? I don't make the rules. And in terms of PCOS, having two of those symptoms makes it very likely that you do have the third, which makes it somewhat okay. And I wanna mention that these cysts aren't actually like other cysts that randomly grow and become potentially cancerous in your body. No, these are actually just the existing sacs for eggs in the ovaries enlarging. I think OBGYN Dr. Ali Abadi put it well when she was interviewed by Dr. Mona Vand on her YouTube channel. So these patients think when they come in, they should have big cysts on their ovaries. It's not true. It's actually an ultrasound finding, um, which is called, uh, which I call it sack of pearls. So their ovaries tend to be a little bit larger with these semi-stimulated little follicles. So just like a sack of pearls, okay. you don't really sit, see these big cysts on them. It's a bad name, but mm -hmm. and I think the name should be changed. But sack that's of pearl what, sounds nicer. Sack of pearl <laughs> sounds nicer. Okay, now if we want to fight this disease, we definitely need to look at potential causes. And well, there are probably some rare genetic causes that are different the most common cause appears to go like this. You have high insulin levels in your body and that actually triggers your ovaries to create more testosterone, which leads to a bunch of effects, including those you know, male hair growth patterns, as well as the loss of ovulation because higher testosterone tells your body to not ovulate. And finally, the testosterone tells those little pouches in your ovaries to grow and mature. And another cosmetic result of high insulin that's worth mentioning is acanthosis, nigricans, which is sort of a, a little black stripe that happens in folds in the body. So the question is, what are the going treatments before we get into diet? Well, you have metformin, which controls blood sugar and then insulin. There's also going on the pill, taking birth control. Now that helps with hormones. And then there's also other crazy things like laparoscopic ovarian drilling. I don't think we wanna go there, so let's look at diet. Now, if you watch my channel, you might already know that high insulin is caused by insulin resistance, and that is intimately linked to diet. And here's diabetes expert Neil Bernard explaining the mechanism. Glucose is there outside the cell trying to get inside. In order to get in, it needs a key, and that key is insulin. What if I get home, and I'm getting up to my front door, and I take my key out of my pocket, and I put it in the front door. Wait a minute, it's not working and there's nothing wrong with my key. But I look in the lock, and while I was gone, somebody put chewing gum in my lock. Well, when a person has diabetes, their insulin key is not working. It's not that there's chewing gum inside the cell. 
What there is is fat. Fat. Little globules of fat. This is also what causes type 2 diabetes. It's no coincidence that Dr. Neil Bernard has studies like this one on whole food vegan diet reversing type 2 diabetes. And when we're talking about diabetes, most people still believe it's sugar and sugar is the cause. But the reality is it's a secondary driver. If your sugar response system is messed up because it's gummed up from fat, then you're going to have problems with sugar and refined carbohydrates in general. Whole unrefined carbohydrates are a completely different situation. They slowly release sugar into your system. And from this study, whole unrefined carbohydrates are inversely associated with insulin resistance. So the initial driver here is animal fat, and that is further corroborated by from the Adventist studies, vegans having 78% lower total risk of all diabetes, yet they eat more carbs, mind blown. Another finding from the Adventist study is that animal protein is positively associated with insulin resistance. This is through several mechanisms, that fat. And then there's also how just protein can spike insulin as well. A lot of people don't know that. And finally, it might be because of the advanced glycation end products or ages. High levels of advanced glycation end products can cause insulin resistance. They also appear to build up in the ovaries, which might lead to some other PCOS issues. And finally, people with PCOS have twice the levels of advanced glycation end products in their bloodstream. And like saturated fat, they are present in plant foods in lower, way lower amounts, but the main source is from animal products. The main particular source is from high temperature cooked meat. From this study, all you know, green leafy vegetables and other vegetables, as well as carbs in general, like grains are very low. Looking at something like bacon though, 10,000 units. How about some, some barbecue chicken? 16,000 units. You know, just going through the meat, you can see it's all of the highest foods. Although it is worth mentioning some dry roasted nuts and some flame grilled plants can get a little bit higher if they're higher in protein. For example, we've got peanut butter hanging around 2000. And then we have grilled tofu, which can get up around 3,000 to 5,000. But it is worth noting from this study that soy has had massively beneficial effects for women with PCOS. Not only has it helped them lose weight, but it also has been shown to lower their testosterone levels among other things. So when you consider that the highest meat foods are about five times higher than the highest plant foods, and those higher plant foods are shown to be great for PCOS, uh, yeah, plants win here, as usual. A vegan hormone profile could be more favorable as well, looking at sex hormone blinding, blinding globulin. <laughs> Ah, I can't see, you're too sexy. Sex hormone binding globulin, which eats up that extra testosterone. Vegetarian women have 50% higher sex hormone binding globulin. And while I couldn't find a study on vegan women specifically, men had about 23% higher as well. At the same time, vegan men from this study have equivalent levels of free testosterone and actually higher total testosterone, so not a concern for men. And I think that binding hormone thing is huge because even if you have some obscure cause of PCOS, this is gonna help bring testosterone down. All right, moving on. There's also fiber, which in general is the vehicle by which excess hormones leave your body. So it's possible that if you don't have enough fiber going through, you could reabsorb testosterone and make it go higher that way. But in general, eating more fiber is just a great weight loss strategy because it triggers our body's natural appetite mechanisms. And this study actually was an intervention for PCOS with a vegan diet. The goal here was totally just weight loss though. And they did lose more weight than the other group, but they didn't go too deep into PCOS measures. But since weight loss is the name of the game, it's definitely worth mentioning the Broad study, which was a whole food vegan diet intervention. And according to the researchers was the most effective diet for weight loss at six and 12 months, where people were not restricted calories and not adding exercise, huge. It's also worth mentioning that Western vegans average a normal BMI unlike other dietary groups. And this is all just very important because as people lose weight, PCOS symptoms tend to get better. And I will say eating a plant-based diet is definitely corroborated, not just by vegans telling you that it's better, but also by the literature. Plant-based doctor Michelle McMacken wrote a good article on this in Forks Over Knives. And she mentions now this 2017 review published in Diabetes and Metabolic Syndrome said a favorable diet plan in women with PCOS should contain low amounts of saturated fat, AKA animal fat, also sufficient amounts of fiber rich whole grains, legumes, vegetables, and fruits with an emphasis on carbohydrate sources that are low glycemic. As she says, hmm, sounds a lot like a plant-based diet to me. All right, let's move on. So if this diet actually works, then there should be a few people floating around that have had good results. And yes, now we're gonna get to the fun stuff of some cases of reversal from Dr. Colin Campbell's nutritionstudies.org. Quote, I had been on medication for PCOS for more than eight years in hopes that I would be able to conceive one day, something my 
doctor had told me might not be possible. After being vegan for eight months, my doctor saw in an ultrasound that I had no cysts and I was ovulating. Here's another girl who after three years of taking medication for PCOS and still having it, went vegan after a few months. She felt so good, she went off that medication, then got a blood test a little bit later with major improvements that the doctors of course attributed to the medication that she stopped taking. She now says, my PCOS is now officially gone. Here's another one, a blogger named Liss or Lise, I don't know. Quote, I was less tired, I had shed off the excess weight I'd put on during birth control, my skin cleared up, my hair was growing thicker, and I just felt better. Finally, my cysts on my ovaries disappeared. And I'll link a couple more stories below, but there's one more point from the literature that I just could not keep from sharing, and that is spearmint tea. This study took 40 women, split them into a 20 person control group and a 20 person spearmint tea group. I know, it sounds like a long shot, but after 30 days, there was some major improvements in their testosterone levels. In the beginning, their free testosterone levels were well out of the normal range, then they dropped by about 40% hovering just above the normal range, massive improvement. In terms of excess hair growth, it doesn't appear that the study was long enough or maybe big enough to detect any objective changes in hair growth, but the people subjectively did say that their hair growth was better. It's unclear what the mechanism here is. Maybe it helped regulate insulin by controlling blood sugar, or maybe it was just the antioxidants preventing oxidative stress in general. Either way, spearmint tea is amazing. Now you know. In the end, while looking at diets to help PCOS, it's clear that a vegan diet is a winner here. A, you have that lower insulin resistance. We've seen that reversal of diabetes, the lower diabetes rate. There's also that normal BMI or the studies showing very effective weight loss. There's also that higher sex hormone binding globulin as well as the lower advanced glycation end product intake. Yeah, we really, we went there this video. I think, I think your brain sponge got it though. It's in the sponge. There's also the increased antioxidant content as well as just the many people that have reversed PCOS on a vegan diet to at least corroborate it anecdotally. Now, I'm obviously not saying that a vegan diet is gonna magically cure everybody's PCOS, but it seems like a great place to start for treatment. And I really wish we could have covered more, but I think I was trying to get a good balance of information, not be too overwhelming here. And if you are interested in this female reproductive health stuff, I do have another video on endometriosis that I will link below and at the end. And if you have had experiences with PCOS and a vegan diet or just in general, let me know. Let us all know down below in the comments and also feel free to like, subscribe if you learned anything and thanks for watching.